Hey guys, it's Ashley and welcome to another edition of Sparky Loves Books Booktube. Today I'm going to be talking about classics. This is going to be kind of an overview of my opinion on classical literature. I double majored in Greek classical studies and English literature when I was in college, yet I haven't really focused any of my booktube videos on that genre yet, so I thought I'd give a comprehensive overview on my feelings about classical literature, just very general without going into too many specifics. This is going to be broken up into three stages. I'm going to talk about what I consider modern classic literature that I think will be eventually like studied in school but that are very current and have been written within the last like 20 years. Um, some pieces that I think shouldn't maybe be classics or not necessarily that they shouldn't be classics but just that I don't like personally and then also classics that I think should have more attention um, and be talked about more. So first of all we have classics that I think need more attention. And some of these maybe do have attention but I haven't ever talked about them with anybody. So these are just ones that I think should maybe be talked about more or that more people should know about when they're getting into the study of classical literature. And the first one is Gertrude Stein. She is an amazing poet who not only did really interesting, really deep very different and varied poetry, but she was a huge presence in literature, not because of her own work, but because she was so influential on other authors and had so many like connections and friendships and stuff, and so it made her very important in literature. She befriended many other authors, many other poets, and so she was a huge, huge presence in the literature um, area, the literature circles and clubs, whatever you want to call it. So she's amazing, but I think she's more known for her friendships maybe than for her poetry, but it's really astounding poetry that can just go into super extensive detail about any little thing. Like I feel like she could write about a cat's tail <laughs> for so long and it would be interesting. The structure of it itself and the way it physically looks when you take it in with your eyes is very interesting a lot of times. And I just... I love it so much and I want to talk about her more. So with her and as with all the other authors, if you do read or have read in the past and enjoyed any of these authors, then please talk to me about them because I would love to go into a deep like analytical session about these authors with you. So let me know. Next is John Donne. He is a poet who wrote before Shakespeare and he writes one of my favorite poems of all time, Valediction of Forbidden Morning. I think it's a beautiful poem and it's probably my top, well maybe not my favorite poem of all time, but like probably my second favorite poem of all time. I'm thinking about getting it tattooed somewhere on me if I can figure out what exactly I want. <laughs> to be represented from the poem and where I want it on my body. I think that his poetry is beautiful, the imagery and the words itself are amazing. I have like four different copies of his complete works and I sit down sometimes and just like write in the margins and analyze the crap out of them just for fun. And I think he often gets overshadowed by like Christopher Marlowe and William Shakespeare and some other people. and. I might be wrong about that. Maybe everybody reads him a lot and I just have been blind to seeing those people, which is possible. Next is Anne Bronte, and I know that actually a lot of people do read Anne Bronte, but um, she does get overshadowed by her sisters, uh, Emily and Charlotte, and so I just wanted to take a minute to say that I love Anne Bronte a lot. <laughs> I love The Tenant of Wildfield Hall and Agnes Grey. They're like often, I think, easier to read than even Wuthering Heights. Maybe not Jane Eyre. I really love Jane Eyre. I actually like Anne's books better than Wuthering Heights. So yeah, I just feel like she should be mentioned in here just because the other Bronte sisters get mentioned so many other times. So that's that. Next is Much Ado About Nothing. This is my absolute favorite play of Shakespeare's. It's a comedy. It's amazing. It has a wonderful lead female character in Beatrice. She is amazing. She was Elizabeth Bennet before Elizabeth Bennet existed, I think. And she is um, just so sharp-witted and always has a comeback 
and is like firm in her beliefs and stuff and she stands her ground and I just love her and it's so funny like the lines in it I have just like stood the test of time and remained funny throughout the years and I think her dialogue with Benedict is so hilarious I just want to read it over and over again and it has everything it's like comedy and drama and love and dra more drama and <laughs> it's just really good so if you're gonna pick up a Shakespeare play I would pick up this one if you haven't picked up this one yet then you should and yeah I could just talk about Beatrice and Benedict and much ado about nothing forever, so I should stop myself before I get carried away. Next is Vanity Fair by William McPeace Thackeray. I think that people do study this in class sometimes, and I think a lot of people do know about it, but I just wanted to mention it because I'm not sure if everybody has really read it. I know a lot of people read Jane Eyre and some other works from that time, but this is like a male written version of like Jane Eyre and some other like semi-gothic literature. It's about Becky Sharp and her, you know, desire to overcome where she was put in life. She kind of, you know, her lot in life was a very low status, sort of on the totem pole, and this is her, like, story of how she overcomes that and tries to, like, get money and become higher ranking in life and doesn't always go as planned and some shady stuff ends up happening. She makes some kind of bad connections and it's just a really great book. It's a huge book. It's so thick. There's so much to read when you read it, but I think it's really well done and I love Becky Sharp. She is very colorful, very charismatic. She hops right out of the page and I adore her. So I think everybody should read this book. Just take the time. I know it's long, but it will be worth it. The next two I'm going to kind of lump together because they both are authors who write sort of similar things. It's Anne Radcliffe and Wilkie Collins. Both of these authors, um, they're classic authors, but they write like gothic literature. It's really good stuff. I read The Woman in White um, in October. I had a goth Tober and I read Woman in White and I read a couple of Anne Radcliffe books too for Gothtober and they were fantastic. They were perfect for the mood. Just really good reading for October for horror, you know, Halloween season. So really if you're looking for gothic literature and you're trying to go outside like H.P. Lovecraft or Poe, I would really recommend Anne Radcliffe and Wilkie Collins. Next is my favorite poet of all time, T.S. Eliot. He wrote the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which is a phenomenal poem. It's really long, but it's wonderful. I could quote that and analyze it and dissect it every day of my life. I just love it. It's the best poem I've ever read. He also writes The Wasteland, and that's also an amazing poem. I, again, could like write essays and essays on that poem as well, but Love Song of Geoffrey Prufrock is just my favorite poem of all time, and again, I know that he is studied in, like, poetry classes and literature classes, but I don't see anybody else talking about him very often, but maybe I'm just following the wrong people and not connecting with those people, and I need to find them, so I'm looking for you. <laughs> if you're a T.S. Eliot fan and you're out there and you're watching this, please talk to me because I'm dying to talk about T.S. Eliot. Yeah, I just... <sighs> I really love T.S. Eliot so much. <laughs> Last but not least is Dorothy Parker. Dorothy Parker, I don't even know how to describe Dorothy Parker. If you ever have a chance, you should pick up the portable Dorothy Parker. She writes amazing poetry and essays and has some like journals and stuff. She's like a really amazing Sylvia Plath is the best thing I can think of. So if you're into that stuff, you should definitely read Dorothy Parker. Um, I just think she's underrated and instead of picking up her books, a lot of people pick up like Sylvia Plath or Virginia Woolf or people like that, but definitely pick up Dorothy Parker. Please do it. She's astounding. I love the way she writes and I love just what she has to say and I really think that more people should read and talk about Dorothy Parker, so do it. Next are the classics that I cannot stand and we're going to start this with Thomas Hardy because Thomas Hardy, I don't understand. Far From the Maddening Crowd, Tessa Durbervilles, uh, Return of the Native, None of them. <laughs> like, I don't like any of them. I have read all of them and I just can't get into them. And I know that Tess is supposed to be like this amazing example of a female character and a heroine and this wonderful, like, 
what all female characters should strive to be and everybody loves her but I cannot stand that book. I have never taken so long to read a book as I did Tess. I, I just think it's boring. All of them are boring and I know he's trying to say something in all of them but I don't know what. I can't get past his prose. It just puts me to sleep. Is not profound in any way in my opinion and I can't stand him. I'm so happy to have that off my shoulders and to have told it to the book universe. I just feel like a weight has been lifted off of me honestly. Next is Willa Cather's My Antonia and my grandmother's favorite book, well one of my grandmother's favorite books of all time is My Antonia and this is incredibly disappointing or I'm incredibly disappointing I should say because I can't stand that book. I just think, again, it's really flat, there's nothing interesting to say, and I don't care about it at all. I don't care about what happens in it, I don't care about the characters, I just, it's just so blah, and <laughs> I feel really bad saying that, but you are who you are, and you can't help what you read, everybody has their own tastes, so, whoops. Next is William Faulkner, <laughs> because William Faulkner is even more boring than Thomas Hardy. Might as well be writing boring pieces of history. Like he might as well be writing a history book in my opinion. It is so lacking dialogue, lacking anything interesting. Absalom Absalom made me like hate books. <laughs> I went through a really horrible reading slump after reading Absalom Absalom. I reread a couple of my favorites because I wanted to get back into something I actually enjoyed. But yeah, William Faulkner is the like least favorite author of all time for me and I again it's just because he's so boring and I know he's supposed to be profound and have wonderful you know writing style and wonderful characters and he's this great author of fantastic deep literature and I just don't get it I don't get it at all just because it's long and wordy doesn't make it good in my opinion and William Faulkner is a prime example of that. Next is Catcher in the Rye, which I actually love, but I think that it's overdone lately. I think that everybody is like obsessed with Holden Caulfield and relates to Holden Caulfield. Some people really love it and think that it's like the best work of literature ever. And then there's the other camp of people who think Holden Caulfield is just a whiny protagonist and this is a horrible piece of literature and it is a fluke that it became famous and like I don't I'm I'm not on either side I just like the book a lot honestly I think it's a good fun like nice read I don't think it's anything worth standing the test of time but I think it's good but it doesn't in my opinion need to be a classic if that makes any sense so that's why it's on this list next is the thorn birds by Colleen McCullough which is again I'm, I'm finding a lot of these are on my list because they're just boring and not interesting this is one of them I just don't care about this book it's supposed to be li like this amazing telling of the Cleary family and it's supposed to be robust good and deep and wonderful and I just again think it's boring and tired and I don't understand the need to read it honestly so that's why it's on this list. Next is Transcendentalist Poets because I'm tired of them. Walt Whitman and Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and the like. I am honestly just tired of seeing them everywhere. Every class I went to in college everybody talks about them and loves Leaves of Grass and Song of Myself and Ralph Waldo Emerson's essays and I'm just like they're all saying the same thing and then I just don't get it. I just think that they're overdone. If you can be a hipster in the 1800s, I feel like these guys were hipsters and it just like, ah, no thank you. Next is Robert Frost, which is probably going to make a lot of people mad because I know that he's a lot of people's favorite poet and that's fine. Like, have your favorite poet, good for you. Everybody should and I'm not dogging that. In my opinion though, I don't think he's very original. I know that a lot of people think that his poems are beautiful and inspirational and well done and they are they're, they are well done and, and they're interesting because they're like modern sonnets modern Shakespeare sonnets I just don't think anything new sort of comes out of them they're not interesting they're just kind of like there's nothing interesting to say about them there's no interesting metaphor no interesting construction of the poems themselves and I just I, I think they're kind of like a cop-out almost it's like a cop-out poem to me, all of them. And if I have to hear one more time about somebody loving the two roads that diverged in yellow and how they took the one less traveled on and it's made all the difference, I'm gonna shove T.S. Eliot at them the next time I hear that because I am so tired of that damn poem. And that's I think why this is on this list is because 
everybody quotes him and I just don't think he's that quotable. I don't think that he should be quoted that often. I think we should be quoting people like T.S. Eliot and John Donne more often instead of him. So, I mean, again, just my opinion and if he's your favorite poet, wonderful for you. I think everybody should have, you know, a favorite poet and have their own opinions. Otherwise, life would be really boring. And finally, William Wordsworth. And just really quickly, the reason William Wordsworth is on this is because he seems like an egotistical little prick. And <laughs> honestly, he just seems like he's full of himself and, and thinks he's going to be this great poet back when he was writing and ends up like becoming a great poet because he writes about the importance of poetry and it's just very like self-serving poetry in my opinion. And so because of that big ego, he's just like a no-no for me. Again, much better, more well done poetry in my opinion, so that's why he's on this list. And finally we have the people I consider to be modern classics, and these are again people who have written recently or fairly recently, like within the last 20 years. The first is Louise Erdrich. She has written, oh my god, how many novels? Like 17 novels, and they all take place in like eastern Washington or Montana, and they're in like Indian reservations, and they are beautiful pieces of literature. I am on a mission to own everything she's ever written and I'm so close. I'm like two books away. I am really excited about that. She just writes this beautiful, awesome literature that is so, like, it's colorful and interesting and always has something to say, like, makes a point about, like, the treatment of other people and stereotypes and it just is wonderful, well-written stuff and I think she's incredibly talented and I want more people to read her, so please read Louise Erdrich. Um, if you're gonna start anywhere, maybe start with The Beat Queen or Love Medicine. Those are two of her more famous, more sort of accessible works, but she also does like children's literature and poetry and essays, so if like long novels aren't your thing, then you can try some of those too. Next is Anne McEwen, who is pretty well known and I think actually is studied in class sometimes, but I just thought he deserved a nod and to be on this modern classics list. He writes most famously Atonement, which was turned into a movie with Keira Knightley, but he writes so many other works. He's pretty prolific. The way he writes is very akin to a lot of the classic authors that we read. He's going to be studied, you know, in the future, I think, and already people, like I said, study Atonement in British literature classes, at least here in California. <laughs> I think everybody should read him. I think the way he writes is worth noting and if you're like trying to learn how to write a novel, like a modern novel, I think you should look to him. I think he's a wonderful example of, of it. He has a great like way of both writing about the present and about the past and going into deep character development but also moving a plot along but not moving it along so fast that it's like an action book. I don't know, I'm explaining this horribly, but he's just well-rounded and wonderful, basically. Next is Jhumpa Lahiri. Jhumpa Lahiri writes, I think the most popular one she has written is The Unaccustomed Earth, but she has a lot of really, really great short stories. I think if you're gonna pick up anything by her, maybe try and find something with um, her short stories in it, because it's a great place to start. But she is a really deep, very, very talented author, so I think she's going places and I think everybody should read her books. She deserves to win all of the bookish awards because she's just astounding and yeah, just just read her. Just do it. Next is Octavia Butler. Octavia Butler writes mostly science fiction. My favorite of hers is Kindred, which is like a time travel book set both in the modern times and in the Civil War, and it's amazing because it's not like a time travel book, it's a book about culture and it is has much more to say than just about time travel and that's not, like it uses time travel to, to tell, to make the point she's trying to make, but she also writes like the parable of the sour and all the other parables books and is just incredible because they have this element of science fiction and maybe a couple of them are just like strictly sci-fi, but mostly they use science fiction elements to make some other point about society and she's just wonderful she, and if you ever can find like her lectures or things like Q&A's with her, her voice is so commanding, she's a very big presence so not only should you read her books but you should also watch her talking. Next is Lois Lowry who I think probably is studied in some like middle school level classes but I just think that The Giver is like the grandfather of dystopia, so it's really important for that reason. Also, Number of the Stars is a World War II, like, Holocaust story, and it's also very important. The Giver is subtle and also not so subtle in its point, in its message, its motif, and it's subtle in that 
Clearly she's saying something about where society is headed and where a regulated society headed, is headed and leads us, you know, if we keep going on this path we're on. But it's also subtle because it's not like The Hunger Games, which is quite clearly about, like, media. And I'm sure everybody has read it, but if you haven't, please read The Giver Quartet. It's like my top five favorite books of all time. I have like six different copies of it and I just think that it should be studied as more than just a piece of young adult literature. Next is Alice Munro, who I think actually won the Nobel Peace Prize for Literature like two years ago, but she's a short story author from Canada and I don't really read much short stories, but she's the exception. They're really good. They should be in every anthology of short stories, I think, because they always have something interesting to say. They're just very well, I don't want to say well-rounded because I feel like I'm overusing that word, but they are. They're just, they're just good, you know? They're, they're just solid stories. And so she's, like I said, won awards for them, but I think still maybe doesn't have as much attention as she should. Pick up, like, Dear Life or any of her other selected short stories because they're easy to get through and really well done so it's 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 good to like have an author who writes well but doesn't take you forever to get through next is dorothy allison who was writing in the 90s i don't know that she's written anything super recently but she writes my one of my favorite books of all time bastard out of carolina which is a difficult book to read honestly because it gets so graphic and violent sometimes but it's a really important read i think all of her books are really important it has a lot of nuances and makes a lot of points that i think maybe go unheard and the way she does them is really interesting because she, she writes about like really difficult family issues and rape and stuff like that but she does it in a way that's like not in your face but still very jarring and it's impressive and i just love it it's again one of my favorite books of all time she's a really important author too she is a lesbian and so if you're looking for an lgbtq author definitely try dorothy allison um she's a very mature author and if you're trying to read something a little bit more mature definitely i would pick her books up next is chris cleave whose most famous book is little b which i know a lot of people have read but since this list is about people who are modern authors i think will eventually be classics i just wanted to put him in there because i think that he is well read right now and like used in a lot of book clubs for book club books but i think he's going to be just more than that i really do think that one day his books are really going to be studied in school and considered classics so i just wanted to put him in this list real quick last but not least is sherman alexi who one of his most famous works is the lone ranger and tonto fist fight in heaven which was turned into a movie called smoke signals also the absolutely true story of a part-time indian he's a lot like louise erdrich in that he always writes about specific groups of people but has something important to say about stereotypes and society in general and he just writes very very well very interesting you really feel for the characters get very emotional for them and again with the writing style being just like an example of great great authorship i wish I could write like him, honestly. I just finished his book Blasphemy, which was so good. It was long, but I, I just, I went through it so fast because it was so well done and I'm just very impressed with him as an author. So that's why I think that he is going to be studied like for years and years to come because he just has very interesting things to say and does them very, very well. And that's it. Let me know what you guys think of this video, especially with those authors that I want to talk about more. If you've studied them or have read them, please let me know. Talk to me. I'm on Tumblr, Sparky Loves Books. I'm on Instagram, Sparky Loves Books. I'm on Twitter, Sparky's Books. Or you can leave a comment below and subscribe if you want to see more videos. Thanks!